Ancient Indian Commerce by Baba Sahib Ambedkar, Part 16 With the subjugation of Egypt, the lucrative commerce from India flowed into Rome, but this was not the only way. There was another trade route for the Indian commodities into the West. It was a land route and was intended by Solomon to concentrate the Indian trade in Judea. It passed the town of Tadmor or Dalmira, situated midway between the Euphrates and the Mediterranean. After the subjugation of Syria by Romans, Palmyra became independent and grew to be a populous and flourishing town. It became a distributing center. But the Roman cupidity knew no bounds. At the slightest sign of ill feeling on the part of Zenobia, the queen of Palmyra, the Romans took the city and ineluded it within their empire. But the inclusion of Palmyra was not enough for the Romans to monopolize the Indian trade for another power equally strong was rising in the east. The Parthians had dominated Central Asia and had made the boundaries of their empire contiguous with that of the Romans. The struggle between Parthia and Rome extended from 55 to 20 BC, but the struggle for supremacy remained indecisive. The warfare between 55 and 20 BC had left the two empires with a wholesome respect for each other, and Augustus left it as a principle of imperial policy that the west bank of the Euphrates was the proper limit of the Roman Empire, beyond which the power of Rome could not with advantage be extended. The policy of the Roman Empire during the two centuries following the Christian era was to encourage direct sea route trade route with India, cutting out all overland routes through Parthia and thus avoiding the annoyance of fiscal dependence on, the ca on that consistent enemy of Rome. Under the Pax Romana, trade between India was greatly fostered and grew so much in importance, guides to the port of in the India and itinerary of land, travels and caravans were begun to be written for the benefits of the merchants. It was during the middle of the 1st century AD that Hippolus, a Greek Egyptian, discovered that regularity of the Indian monsoon and thus facilitated the voyage of the traders. It was also about this time that a Greek merchant wrote the Periplus of the Eritrean Sea, or Guide to the Indian Ocean. It is the most authentic document we have for the study of the Indian commercial activity. Another Greek adventurer, Isidore of Cherax, travelled around the Parthian kingdom and gave a full account of the caravan trade along the planned route. Before this, it had to receive the oriental goods from the hands of the others. The Arabs concealed all information relating to India to perpetuate their monopoly, and the Parthian tolls greatly augmented the value of the Indian commodities, so that this rich trade had flowed to Rome, paid its tolls to the empire of Parthia, and to the Arab kingdoms, unless Rome could develop and control a seaborne trade to India. But this discovery of the monsoons by Hippolus, the Columbus of modern times, fulfilled much felt want of the Romans. Great shiftings of national power followed this entry of the Roman shipping into the Indian Ocean. One by one, Pitya and Gara, Palmyra and Parthia itself, their revenues sapped by the diversion of the custom trade, fell into Roman hands. The Homerite kingdom in South Arabia fell upon hard times, its capital into ruin, and some of its best men northward, and as the Ghassanids bowed the neck to Rome, Abyssinia flourished in proportion as its old enemy declined. If this state of things had continued, the whole course of later events might have changed. Islam might have never appeared, appeared and a greater Rome might have left its system of law and government from the Thames to the Ganges. But the logic of history was too strong. Gradually, the treasures that fell to the Roman arms were ex expended in suppressing insurrections in the conquered provinces, in civil wars at home, and in a constant drain of species to the east in the settlement of adverse trade balances, a, trade, a drain which was very real and menacing to a nation which made no notable advance in production or industry by means of which new wealth could be created. The end.